Thank you everyone for joining ACRL's Distance Learning Section Discussion Group today for what I think is going to be a very exciting conversation about copyright in distance learning with our expert panel. Um, again, I'm Jill Hallen Miller. I'm the Discussion Group Chair for the Distance Learning Section, and I'd like to make a few acknowledgments before we get started. First, I'd like to thank ACRL and especially Allison Payne and Chase Aulis for getting, at us, getting us set up with the technology. Also, the Distance Learning Section Executive Committee for their support in bringing you this presentation. Special thanks goes to the DLS Chair, Alice Dockerty, for her support of our virtual presentation initiative. I'd also like to thank this year's really top-notch discussion group committee for their hard work and dedication to making this panel discussion happen. The committee will be working behind the scenes today to make sure our discussion runs smoothly. We've prepared some questions that we'll pose to the panelists, but we recognize that many of you may have your own questions that we won't have asked. And we do encourage you to post your questions in the chat box or to Twitter. Our committee member, Lindsay Wharton, will be monitoring Twitter and addressing any questions that come up there. So if you're tweeting about the session today, please be sure to use hashtag DLS copyright chat. Committee member Dr. Kristen Brand Heathcock will be compiling your questions from the chat box today and making sure that those are addressed after the main panel discussion. And committee member Tina Adams will be watching for chat box posts about technical issues and trying to assist anyone who's having trouble. The entire committee has been involved in bringing this panel discussion about, and the team is already working on a few more exciting presentations for the 2014-2015 year. So stay tuned for more information in the coming months. And finally, and finally, I, oh, tweeting, DLS copyright chat. Finally, I would like to thank our panelists for being here today and for sharing their expert knowledge with us. We're very fortunate to have them with us today. And I'll go ahead and introduce the panel. Patricia Alsterhide is uni university professor in the School of Communication at American University in Washington, D.C and director of the Center for Media and Social Impact there. Pat is the co-author with Peter Jazzy, I hope I'm saying that right, Pat, of Reclaiming Fair Use, How to Put Balance Back in Copyright, University of Chicago Press, July 2011, and author of, among others, Documentary, A Very Short Introduction, Oxford 2007, The Daily Planet, University of Minnesota Press 2000, and of Communications Policy in the Public Interest, Guilford Press, 1999. She heads the Fair Use and Free Speech Research Project at the Center in conjun conjunction with Professor Peter Jazzy in American University's Washington College of Law. She's been a Fulbright and John Simon Guggenheim Fellow and has served as a juror at the Sundance Film Festival, among others. She's received numerous journalism and scholarly awards, including the Preservation and Scholarship Award in 2006 from the International Documentary Association, a Career Achievement Award in 2008 from the International Digital Media and Arts Association, and the Women of Vision Award from Women in Film and Video, D.C. in 2010. Luann Edwards is a higher education prof professional with roughly 15 years of experience in academic librarianship and instruction. She's worked in various capacities for a variety of on-ground and online institutions throughout her career, and she thoroughly enjoys every aspect of li librarianship and instruction, even copyright. She holds an MLIS from Kent State University and an MA in English from National University. She's currently the e-librarian for Tiffin University, located in Northern Ohio. Luann recently played a role in the development of a copyright policy for her institution. Anne Gilliland, who after several decades of work as a university librarian and for a library consortium, went to law school in midlife. She came to work at the University of North Carolina as the scholarly communications officer in 2012. Most recently before that, she was an assistant director of library systems at OhioLINK from 1993 to 2008 and the head of the Health Sciences Copyright Management Office at The Ohio State University from 2008 to 2012. 
Anne has an MS in Librarian Information Sciences from the University of Tennessee and a JD from Capital University, Columbus, Ohio. Kevin Smith as Duke University's first Director of Copyright and Scholarly Communications. Kevin's principal role is to teach and advise faculty, administrators, and students about copyright, intellectual property licensing, and scholarly publishing. He's a librarian and an attorney admitted to the bar in Ohio and North Carolina, and also holds a graduate degree in religion from Yale University. At Duke, Kevin serves on the university's intellectual property board and convenes the Open Access Advisory Panel. He's a past chair of the ACRL's Research and Scholarly Environment Committee and serves on the SPARC Steering Committee and the Board of Directors of the Dryad Data Repository. His highly regarded weblog on scholarly communications, and I'm going to go ahead and read the URL, http colon slash slash library.duke.edu slash blogs slash scholcom, so that's S-C-H-O-L-C-O-M-M -M slash discusses copyright and publication in academia, and he's a frequent speaker on those topics. So panelists, at this point in the program, even though you can't hear them, the participants here are giving you a round of enthusiastic applause. So I think we can go ahead and begin. And what we'll, what we'll do here is um, we'll go ahead and I will pose a question, I'll ask uh, a random panelist to respond to that question, and then if any of the other panelists would like to add something on or uh, mention something else, we'll do that. So we'll start out with the basics, and Kevin, I was hoping that you could answer the question, what are some of the similarities regarding copyright between distance learning and face-to-face -face teaching, and what are some of the differences? Okay, sure. Um, of course, the first similarity, the most important thing we have to say is it is the same law. Uh, the copyright law is, in most of its provisions, essentially technologically neutral. And so we apply the same principles uh, in the digital realm that we would in the print realm. Now, there are some specific provisions that are technologically specific. So the TEACH Act, and I see that's coming up in a later question, the TEACH Act that allows for certain kinds of performance and displays in a uh, online teaching environment, it, it, I think it says digital uh, uh, transmitted over a digital network. So that's very specific to a particular technology, and it's adopted specifically to deal with uh, distance learning. But fair use, for example, is exactly the same principle that we use in the print environment as in the distance learning environment. Also, a lot of the time, the distance learning setting is the same. That is, you have a professor and a class of students, 30, 40, 60, however many students, uh, and you're working in a closed environment. So uh, basically the same things that you would think you could do in the live classroom, you can pretty much do in an online environment when it's closed like that. Things change a bit when the environment opens up to the entire world. And as I said, there are some specific exceptions, such as the TEACH Act, that limit a little bit what we can do in an online environment. It's an attempt to recreate the face-to-face -face classroom environment, and it sort of does that, but it imposes some restrictions that don't exist in a face-to-face -face environment. So I'll stop there because I see there are some other questions uh, that will deal with the same things, and my colleagues may want to say things. Anne or Pat, did you want to add anything on to what Kevin said? Yeah. Um, I defer to Anne. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess the, the, the thing I would add is that the intention in both situations is to facilitate teaching and to make a copyright exception for for the benefit of teaching and learning. So that is is the same. Um, as Kevin mentioned, one of the differences is that the law is a tad different depending on whether you're using the Teach Act or not. But I think the thing to keep front and center in all of these analyses is what 
what what are you trying to do and what's the purpose of it and how does that balance out vis-a-vis vis the those um, exclusive rights of the rights holder. Okay, great. And um, Anne, I believe, or Kevin actually mentioned something about the fact that we're in a closed environment when you're in an online course and, you know, you're using the LMS. And do you think you could could maybe give us some insight into how the how the degree of openness in the distance learning environment environment might influence copyright considerations? Were you were you asking me or were you asking Kevin? I'm sorry, Anne. Uh, I was asking. Okay, you. okay. <laughs> Just got confused there for a moment. Um, so the degree of openness, well, I think there's two issues, and one of them is if you're using the TEACH Act, uh, uh, there are some specific requirements to, with regard to the closed environment and the, the sort of lack of openness of the environment that you've got to fulfill in order to use that specific exception. If you're relying um, on fair use for uh, using copyright material in a distance classroom, the really sort of the crux of the matter involves the uh, the degree of openness and the market harm, so or, or per sometimes perceived market harm. So uh, when I'm advising people, for example, if uh, someone is putting material uh, for a class in a uh, course management system that's closed and only open to the people in that class. Uh, I feel more comfortable with a greater degree of material being used and, and, and so on than if it's going to go on an open website. And it's, a lot of times I think people find that sort of unfair and frustrating, which I totally understand. But uh, when it's open to the world, the um, rights holders are often more worried about that and, and for, to some degree for a reason because the the uh, possibility that a larger number of people will see or, or listen or, or whatever to what to what's posted is greater and there can be um, perhaps the, they'll miss a sale. Okay, great. So um, so it sounds like maybe we have a little more leeway in what we do when it's in the closed CMS environment, only the registered students can access the information than if it's out on the open web. I think that's the way most most people um, who do what I do uh, proceed, yeah. And this is Kevin. I would agree with that. I wanted to make two quick points. One, uh, I absolutely agree with what Anne says about the TEACH Act requiring a closed environment. That's very clear. One point, one thing that that means is that sometimes the, we want to work on social media platforms that already exist. And that can be very risky if we're relying on the TEACH Act because they're not built the way an LMS is built to uh, close. They, if sometimes you can manipulate them so that only a small, a close set of people have access to the material. But you have to work harder if you're using WordPress or Facebook or something like that than you do if you're using your LMS. So that's just a quick warning. The other thing I wanted to say is about um, Anne's point and her excellent point about fair use and market harm. I think that really is the crux of the issue when we're talking about something that's on the open web, except that I wanted to emphasize a lot depends on whether or not the use is transformative. And if the use is transformative, courts apply a somewhat different analysis in determining fair use, and market harm becomes a lot less important. So just to give you a quick example, when we work with people who are teaching MOOCs, if they are taking something and incorporating it into a slide that is part of their lecture so that it becomes a part of a new creation, a new meaning, a new pedagogical purpose. We think that even though the MOOC is open to everybody on the web, there's still a strong argument for that incorporated material that is transformed. We think that's likely to be fair use. On the other hand, we're much less likely, in fact, we don't rely on uh, fair use to distribute readings to the students in the class. 
Uh, in those cases, we either get uh, openly licensed material, Creative Commons or open access material, or we get permission from the publisher. Because when we're not transforming the use where we're, with the, the material, when we're just presenting it uh, as it is, if you will, to an open group of students, we feel unwilling to rely on fair use. And I think that's just making uh, a, a slightly more um, nuanced distinction to what Anne was already saying. Yeah, context is everything in these analyses, really. And, and I think that issue of whether or not it's transformative. Um, I think we've seen the Which is the of, context, yeah. Which is the context, fair enough. <laughs> And uh, just to chime in here um, on on real life experience, uh, the um, the people uh, but does provide course materials for people, some of which are copyrighted. Uh, it developed a code of best practices for themselves. That uh, then this is Pat. Um, they developed a code of best practices that because they were completely stymied without being able to use fair use on the open web and uh, while they uh, and they do anchor everything in this concept that that Kevin mentioned of transformativeness but uh, they have been able to uh, post some materials and um, I think not materials that are directly designed for courses because material that is directly and, and assigned them for reading, material that's directly designed for courses, like you're teaching biology and there's a biology textbook, that if you use that for on the open web um, and claim fair use, what people are going to say is that's not a transformative use because the original market is selling biology textbooks to biology classes. Um, but they have been able to. Uh, put up uh, material that was not designed for the course. Now, they've made that decision themselves, and they've made it according to the understanding of their own, their own field. But I certainly agree with, with both Anne and Kevin that context is everything, that uh, fair use at this point in legal history really uh, trans that concept of transformativeness is dispositive. It's not. In, it's it, transformativeness does not mean you changed something in the thing itself, but it means you changed the use of it in order to do something different with it. I mean, it could mean you changed something in itself too, but but changing changing the thing also does not guarantee that you you had a transformative use. If you take a picture and you solarize it, many of my artist friends want to say, well, I did seven things to it, and now it's transformed. And um, you would still need to be putting it in a different context, and Anne gave us that great word, context. Thank you. I want to just add something to what Pat just said, because she said that the issue of transformativeness is, dispos is dispositive. Excuse me, I'm having trouble articulating today is dispositive. And it is in one sense and it isn't in another. That is, when a court finds that a use was transformative, they are very, very likely to find that it's fair use. But when a court finds that a use isn't transformative, as the Court of Appeals in the Georgia State case has said just in the past week about uh, electronic reserves. The court said that wasn't a transformative use, but they went on to say, in this instance, um, transformative is, is not dispositive. It doesn't settle the case. We still can do the regular fair use analysis based on the four factors and find fair use. So transformativeness may be dispositive in a positive sense. When it is transformative, it's very likely fair use. But it's not uh, dispositive in a negative sense. When something isn't transformative, there may still be room for fair use. Oh, hooray, and I'm so glad Kevin mentioned that. And I just also want to point out that the, that the GSU case only relates to scholarly texts. And frequently, academic use of scholarly texts really isn't transformative. They were frequently u written for the uses that people would use them for um, in a class. So, um, you know, you, well, you, you, know you, you may or may not in all cases have 
have an argument for transformative use, the, it's re, for, for all your materials, it's really important to realize that the GSU case is only about scholarly monographs. And it's also occasionally, and un, perhaps unfortunately, true that sometimes the use is transformative, but we decide not to make that use in an open environment because of the risk. Um, a good example that I encounter a lot, and I know Kevin does, are sometimes you know highly commercialized um, pictures, uh, cartoons, things like that. Uh, the use may be quite transformative, but it is sometimes not a good idea. Uh, so that's another thing to consider, uh, not part of the statute, but part of life. <laughs> oh, darn it, life keeps intruding. Uh, and, and I do agree um, that, you know, fair use, because it is flexible, is also never completely certain, or at least seldom completely certain. There are some things we do that we know are fair use, taking a quotation and dropping it into uh, an academic work that we're writing, or doing an interview, you know, videotaping an interview with somebody and Wheel of Fortune happens to be on the television in the background. Those sorts of things I think we are pretty comfortable in thinking of as fair use. Um, but, and I've, I've sort of lost my train of thought here. Oh, um, can there I, are can other, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You'll, well, you'll help I me just, recover it. Great. I just wanted to jump in on this, this notion of things we're comfortable with and things we're not comfortable with because uh, it goes back to what my colleague, Peter Yassi, uh, who was supposed to be here, I'm, just, I'm basically just subbing for him. Uh, he had to teach at this hour. But uh, he, he is always saying fair use is like a muscle. You know, you, you lose, use it or you, you lose, lose it. The two examples that Kevin gave are really fascinating. I think that scholars are very comfortable using quotations as our students and teachers because they do it all the time. And because everybody does it all the time and nobody gets in trouble. The second example is absolutely fascinating when you have incidental use. Because until 10 years ago, documentary filmmakers who faced this situation, they had music in an elevator, somebody was playing a television in the background, um, the teenagers would be riding in the car with the radio on. Uh, documentary filmmakers actually traveled with pre-cleared music in packets and CDs and would, or, you know, in tape decks and then CDs and then would take make people turn off stuff and supplement and, and, and substitute pre-cleared music because they didn't have a notion of, of what their their rights were under fair use. And today, we just did a survey so we know this, uh, today filmmakers uh, across the country, documentary filmmakers now calmly, without a question, assume that they have the right of fair use for incidental use like Kevin mentioned. And the reason they do is because they've established they, they too created a code of best practices. They've established a baseline for themselves of the areas which they think are the most, um, the, the safe harbor zones for fair use for them because they're so core to mission and in context of their work, it makes sense. So uh, to the extent you have fair use eligible to you, it's clear to you that you can use it and you decide not to use it, uh, what happens is that your the zone of comfort for fair use shrinks for everyone. And I actually picked that example, Pat, because I wanted to illustrate the impact that the uh, codes of best practice can have. But I still want to agree with Anne and say that we are always looking at risk when we look at fair use because of its uncertainty. And the, what you did with the code of best practices is take a place where people were misappraising the risk and help them get a better view of it. But the fact is that we do need to think about risk and that even lawsuits that we could win are extremely expensive and we'd like to avoid them. At least we want to fight them on grounds where we feel it's, it's vitally important. So we very well, well, very well may uh, say to our faculty who are doing an online course, for example, let's take the Dilbert cartoon out. Um, maybe there's a transformative fair use argument, more often there's not in that situation, but let's just take it out because it's not the key to what you're trying to communicate to your students and it creates a red flag. And what we don't want to have happen is an online course to be taken down 
off of it, the service provider, uh, because somebody has sent a takedown notice because of something we've put up. Even if we could win the argument, uh, just practical considerations suggest to us that we just would like to avoid that, that particular fight. In other words, we pick our battles. I'm very grateful to, to you, Kevin, for, for pointing that out because I, uh, I would never want to be misinterpreted as saying uh, you, should be, you should be indulging in risk that is, is greater than any risk that, that you either want to take or that is, that is minimal. And you're quite right that the situations that we've been able to identify with, with uh, different groups, including librarians, that are the, the comfort zones for fair use have been very useful to them. Uh, the, the point I was making is that if you're in a comfort zone for fair use uh, and you don't take it, that's, that's uh, constraining your options needlessly. But to, uh, to undertake a situation where you, you think you are exposing yourself to more risk, I think, you know, my, my big mantra is um, nobody should have to be courageous. They should be able to use their first fair use rights the way they use there are other First Amendment rights. You know, they, they pretty well know when they're not making treasonous or obscene or, or libelous statements, and, and that fair use should be like that, too. Yeah, and I think it also, again, goes back to the whole business of looking at the educational purpose and uh, how does that, how does what you're going to do strengthen the, the, the pedagogical point you're going to make. And I did see a question about linking to the Dilbert cartoon. Could, could we link to the Dilbert cartoon and be in the clear? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and that's an option that people take sometimes and that works out pretty well for them. And that's perfect. That, I think that's a very important thing to say, that when we think about risk, we need to remember that there is a risk of litigation, and we want to avoid that if we can, but there's also a risk in not doing something that's pedagogically important. And so we're always balancing what we think is safe to do and what's really necessary to accomplish the teaching purpose. And uh, I would qualify Pat's reference to comfort zones by saying sometimes we do want to get out of our comfort zone because the purpose is so important. And then I, I agree with you entirely about linking, which is always a way that we can address some of those concerns. And one more thing to say about thinking about risk is we should take the risks when they're really, really important. And when we can find other ways to accomplish the same purpose, such as linking to the cartoon, then that's great because we haven't had to compromise our teaching uh, to do that. Okay, great. Um, this you got more than you expected, didn't you, Jill? <laughs> well, I have a couple of follow-up questions from that discussion. And the first one, I think, um, Pat, if you could just tell us, your voice cut out in the very beginning when you were talking about uh, writing a code of practices. Was it the American University that, that wrote the code of practices? Sorry, I just unmuted myself. Um, I just responded on this topic on the um, the chat, but but uh, and if if you can let, give me the that that colored ball so I could show people my uh, the website, I can also show where you can find them. Uh, but uh, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now let's see. There's supposed to be some button here that says share my screen, but I'm not seeing it. Uh, the panelist thing is hiding it. Is that supposed to be the way it is? Allison, are you still with us? Can you um, tell us how to switch over to share my screen? Hmm. Well, I tell you what, just, I'll just tell people um, that the, uh, the Center for Media and Social Impact houses all these documents. And that's at cmsimpact.org slash fair use. And um, the librarians one is at cmsimpact.org slash libraries. But uh, what Peter Yassi and I have done with all these groups, with all these communities of practice, and we've worked with 10 of them, is to um, coordinate the discussions among them to first find out where their, um, their areas of needless trouble are, where they are having trouble with things that they, they probably don't need to have trouble with, and then to articulate their, their best understanding of how their mission relates 
to um, this to interpreting fair use, so that their their safe harbor areas or their their comfort zone areas are associated strongly with mission. And again, this goes back to that word context, making sure that the uh, use is transformative within a mission-based context, context. And then we also house it for them. But many people, many organizations, including the Association of Research Libraries, house these materials on their own sites as well and continue to provide services to their members around them. Pat, if you want to share your screen on the menu at the very top, share is one of the options. And it may be covered by the volume uh, the, uh, the audio box. I had to move my audio box to see it, but then there's a share option. Uh, is that on the line that says WebEx? It's just below it where it's file, edit, share. And you can move your volume box out of the way. That is not the problem. I see quick start event info copyright or. I'm sorry, it should be above that and below WebEx. Maybe we better move on. <laughs> I think we have to move on because I'm not seeing what you're seeing. I'm very sorry. Okay. Um, and so you can move the ball back to you. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, I think, Pat, you have to move the ball back to me. Okay. Um, so the other follow-up question was, are there any issues in keeping readings in a closed LMS for too many years in a row? Meaning, does it matter if a reading is in an online course for a year or for five years for many sections of students in regards to fair use? And maybe Kevin, if you want to respond to that first. I was really hoping that would go elsewhere. Um, well, the interesting thing is that that rule about so-called spontaneity or subsequent semesters, um, that has come from the guidelines that were adopted into the legislative history uh, of the Copyright Act in 1976 about classroom copying. Those guidelines, first of all, they meant they were about a different situation. They were basically about photocopying out of the New York Times, this morning's New York Times, to hand a copy out to your students. Um, they were a minimum safe harbor not a maximum, and in the GSU appeal, the court reaffirmed and told the publishers you cannot rely on those as limits to fair use. They were a minimum. They were not agreed to by all the parties in the negotiation, and um, they're pretty much out of date. So we have gotten that rule about the length of time from guidelines that really should not be used as the, the definition of fair use. Uh, and the courts have rejected them several times now in the Georgia State case. So insofar as we think that that rule is part of those guidelines, um, we, we don't need to pay attention to it. And I would argue that what is fair use, if it is fair use uh, for a class in the fall of 2012, uh, it will be fair use for another class, a different group of students, in the fall of 2013. Having said that, your question says, you know, can we leave the reading up for five years? Um, you know, if something has been scanned and is going to be used repeatedly by a class, then yes, I think you probably can leave it up for five years, but not accessible. It should only be accessible by the individual classes for which it's a reading, uh, you know, it's a, it's a course reading. Um, so while we don't have to observe the subsequent semester rule with any kind of strictness, we might choose to as a matter of policy. How do we decide when we want to try and get permission in order to manage our risk? We might decide that, you know, after the second semester, after the third semester, we're going to ask permission. That would be a policy decision. But we don't have to observe it as a matter of course. But we should make sure that the readings are only accessible to students who are in a class at that time. And if it's kept on a server, it should be dark when it's not being used in class. So that's, that's my take on that question. And at my university, this is Pat, and my university, this is exactly what we do. I, I've offered some of the same materials for uh, a decade for in, in some, of my, uh, some of my classes. And my argument has always been I am not in I don't think it's good pedagogy to offer my students the second best reading on this topic um, because it is recontextualized. It is a, uh, it, it, I do have a strong fair use reason, and it's the same one as last year, but that doesn't mean that it went away. Um, 
but and my university agrees, but they they pull it down uh, the day that the class ends, and it is it is held in a dark environment, and it goes back up when the course begins again. And the other thing that happens if you have a very strict subsequent semester rule is that you may have um, readings or materials that are really minimal. And um, it can lead to, to some absurd results where, say, uh, uh, I once encountered a situation where uh, a, a one-page reading uh, that the uh, the university was paying permissions for that one-page reading uh, over and over and over again, and it really was a, a very, very minimal use. Um, but a uh, ironclad subsequent semester rule has no provision for that kind of, of um, latitude, so that so that uh, that sort of thing doesn't doesn't happen. It really didn't make a lot of sense. Okay. Any other comments on that? Okay, let's move on. Um, actually, let's not move on. Let's back up to Dilbert again for just a moment, if we could. Um, so Greg Clark asks, why not use the Dilbert cartoon and then take it down when you get the takedown notice and use this as a way to expand fair use to the maximum without a suit being involved, which is kind of something that, that Pat was saying that um, you know, we want to kind of push it a little bit, but we still need to think about the risk. So what are your thoughts about that? Pat, maybe do you want to start with that? Well, I agree with, um, I agree with Kevin that you want to be able to say to somebody who's not related to you with a straight face, this is actually important to my mission. And if the Dilbert the Dilbert cartoon is central and it's clear and the in the repurposing of Dilbert, which was clearly designed to, to entertain people in a you know in a newspaper context, if that repurposing is clear to somebody who is not related to you, uh, then then I think that's fine. But um, I want to be able to say that about all the stuff that I use. I want to, and I, I never want to be in the position of asking the question, can I get away with this? I want to be able to say comfortably, well, you know, I really need this, and it's not the purpose for which it was originally on the market. And uh, this is, you know, this is going, this is part of my uh, continuing added value to this work and contribution to new culture. Yeah, two things about that. One is we do have to look at context, as Anne reminded us, and Pat just, just basically said it. Are you using the, the cartoon to get a laugh, which is essentially its original purpose, or are you actually talking about it as a pedagogical um, tool? You know, are you using it to make a are – you, are you talking about the ways in which humor uh, is, are, is, uh, works? Um, then you might actually have a good fair use argument. But I think the most important thing to say in response to Greg's question is to remind people what the takedown notice uh, provisions of the copyright law do. They protect Internet service providers for whom who provide a place where users can upload material without their knowledge, without control by the ISP. In that situation, if an ISP gets a takedown notice and they promptly take the material down and go through the process, they are insulated from uh, litigation. They can't be sued. The lawsuit would be between the user who uploaded the material and the, uh, uh, the rights holder. In the case that we're discussing, where our faculty are putting stuff into a LMS or a, uh, a MOOC platform, whatever it is, as part of their job for us, we cannot claim that they are users acting independently of us. So the takedown provisions, even though they might be used, that is to say the rights holder might send a takedown, we're not insulated from litigation because we're not in the position that the takedown notice was designed to create. Uh, so you say wait for the takedown notice, okay, that might be a, a strategy where there's not much to lose, but it is the case that you could still, they wouldn't have to use a takedown notice, and even if they did use a takedown notice, they could still sue you. Uh, so I, I don't think that's very likely, but it is important to realize that the 
the situation in which the takedown notice actually insulates you from litigation is fairly narrow and doesn't apply to a lot of what we're talking about. Okay, great. I see that there are some more questions coming in, but I think we're going to get to those um, in just a little while when we talk about media. So I'm going to hold off on asking those. Um, I am going to, to move on now to, well, we didn't really get to, to address the TEACH Act. Um, Kevin and Anne, I believe you both mentioned it when we started the conversation, but Anne, I wondered if you could talk to us about the requirements of the TEACH Act as they pertain to distance education. Sure, and um, if you would hand me the green ball, I'll try and share a screen with some um, nice uh, explanation of the TEACH Act um, and the requirements of it because they are many and, and uh, complicated. <laughs> it look like sharing is going to work for you, Anne? Uh, let's see. Oh. Okay, why don't I start by giving you the URL instead of having you sit here and listen to me thrash around. So um, there, there are several great uh, Teach Act checklists. Um, I've linked to the one at the University of Texas uh, copyright, copyright Crash Course, and um, I put that in the uh, chat, chat the URL in the chat box. So um, the Teach Act uh, allows the transmission of performances of non-dramatic literary or, um, and musical works. They need to be reasonable and limited portions of any other performance. And the um, dis displays of works that are transmitted have to be comparable to face-to-face -face displays. So, and one of the things that is important to remember with TEACH is that they only replies to um, accredited nonprofit educational universities, institutions. So if you work for a uh, commercial for-profit university, you aren't covered by that. Um, you also should not use under TEACH works that were produced or marketed for in-class use in the digital distance education market. Um, and so you, uh, the, the uh, a performance or display needs to be a part of mediated instructional activity made by, at, or at the direction of, or under the supervision of the instructor, directory related and of material assistance to the teaching content, and for and technologically limited to students enrolled in the class. Uh, so, so it has to be have a pedagogical purpose and it has to be for the students. Uh, the, unit, the institution that uses TEACH has to have policies and provide information about copyright and should use a plot, uh, technological method, measures that reasonably prevent recipients from retaining the works beyond the class session and further distributing them and not interfere with technological measures get taken by copyright owners that prevent retention and distribution. So in other words, the institution must alert students about copyright, um, have a cop copyright policies of some sort, and uh, take, take steps to make sure that students can't um, keep, keep reusing and, and redistributing the, the material. And then, and this is the section that often is people's downfall, is that uh, they, they need to be uh, they need to be retained only by the institution and used only for the activities authorized and for digital analog, digitizing analog works. No digital version of the work is available free from technological protections that will prevent the uses authorized in Section 110. So that, um, and you know, I'm sure all of you are kind of nodding off as I went through all that. It's. Uh, a lot to take in, but uh, many sites, including University of Texas, has a checklist for you to go through and uh, ascertain whether what you want to do is in 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 harmony with the Teach Act. Uh, as I said, some of the things that uh, are kind of a 
a problem for people a lot of times um, is that the, the limited and reasonable parts is not really defined and, and sometimes people struggle with, with what that is. Um, and that uh, that there are these these um, sort of limits on how how it can be how the material can be stored and used. Uh, so for many many situations, the teach act is not always the best method for making for using copyrighted works in an online class. But uh, when it works, it works well. <laughs> yeah, but but frankly, for a lot of material it's not it's not the best analysis to go through uh, in order to uh, find a copyright exception. Okay, great. Thank you for covering that. <laughs> um I think that in a way can, can I can I interrupt? I, I had my sure. myself muted, but I, I want to slightly disagree with Anne because mm -hmm. I do think there are situations where the TEACH Act is usable. Um, and actually, if you look at that checklist, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, some of the things are just routine, uh, things that would already be the case in a not, at least in a non-MOOC or, or entirely open environment. The one point I wanted to make is that the business about using reasonable technological measures to make sure that students can't retain or redistribute the material, it's interesting that when the TEACH Act was written, it was very hard to figure out what those things would be, uh, and that was one of the big stoppages for people relying on it, that they just didn't technologically know how to do that. Well, we know from uh, the legislative history of the TEACH Act that streaming is considered a reasonable measure in regard to uh, film and music. And that's interesting because, I mean, most people know how to capture a stream, uh, but the law doesn't say it has to be perfect. It says they have to be reasonable steps, and in the legislative history they specifically mention streaming as such a reasonable step. In terms of something like images, in the early days of the TEACH Act, there were real struggles to figure out how could we make it so that images couldn't be retained. Um, and North Carolina State University developed a, a really sort of sophisticated technology that imposed a blank GIF file over an image so that if you right-clicked and tried to save it, what you would save would be the, uh, the clear, transparent GIF uh, and not the original image. It's gotten much easier. Uh, you, we can essentially, if, if we use PDF, for example, we now have security settings that allow us to prevent right-click and save. So there are easier technologies that have developed since the adoption of the TEACH Act that make it more usable. And I think some of my um, uh, somewhat dismal review of the TEACH Act comes from, um, I used to deal a lot with um, medical school students who wanted to save lectures and um, listen to them again before they took their boards and things like that. And it's often not the best solution for those kinds of situations. Um, but it, it, as, you, as Kevin says, in other situations, it works pretty well. And in those other situations, we simply have to look to other provisions like fair use. And I have two follow-up questions for this discussion. The first is, couldn't one just use screen capture? I'll say yes, because I don't quite know what I'm being asked. Yeah, for what, I guess, is my follow-up. Oh, but you mean possibly for an image? Could you use a screen capture and then put that up? I, I don't know whether that would be a technological measure that would reasonably prevent students from downloading the image. Would it? I, I'm just if not sure. People think that screen capture gets them out of the questions that, that, that would afflict them in regard to copyright. Otherwise, it doesn't. Okay. I, I, if I understand it, 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 some of the filmmakers ask me this. They're like, well, couldn't I just take a picture? Couldn't I just take a, a picture of what's on the screen rather than uh, licensing the image or having to go through a fair use question? And, and you know, my answer is no, it's, you know, it's all copyrighted. But that, that actually helps clarify it for me. 
Um, in regard to the portion of the law that says that we can't circumvent technological protection measures, the courts have said, it, it's kind of foolish actually, but the courts have said, you know, you don't have to decrypt the DVD to, you, to make a fair use of its contents. You can just take an analog picture, a film of the DVD, and use that for your fair use purposes. It's kind of a Rube Goldberg answer to a law that is uh, not very practical, but that may be what the, uh, what the questioner is referring to. That would get you around the issue of circumvention, but it doesn't get you past the underlying copyright issue, and it doesn't solve whatever problem it is that the TEACH Act creates. The TEACH Act, in fact, Anne read some of the provision. The TEACH Act allows you to circumvent technological protections when there's no non-DRM uh, version available to you. So you don't really need that analog hole in the anti-circumvention rules in order to make use of something for TEACH Act purposes. Oh, and furthermore, um, the, the uh, Copyright Office has provided all professors of all courses with an exemption from uh, the encryption penalties if they, right, they are right. implying fair use. So there's no, if you are implying fair use, there's no penalty for de-encryption. Although, well, I'm not positive of the current form of the exception. Last I knew it applied only to DVDs that were encoded with CSS. That's correct. Oh, you're so right. You are so right. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. That's right. You can see why people tear their hair out over the yeah. T-Shack. Yeah, we're, we're kind of in the weeds here, and I think we're proving what Ann said. <laughs> okay. Um, Kevin, we have a follow-up question for you specifically uh, from uh -oh. Claudia Holland, who read your blog today, in which you stated that proprietary content placed in e-reserves is not considered a transformative use, use as per fair use. Is that because the transformative context for that content is not directly linked to the copy made available in e-reserves? And then she says, in a DE course, a distance education course, or even using an LMS for any class, if reserves is in that Blackboard course, I think she's saying Blackboard, couldn't the professor provide some context that would support an argument of transformative use? My answer to couldn't the professor do that, I'd say yes. When I said that it was not considered transformative, I, that's in the context of the, two case, of the case. Both the courts, the lower court uh, in their decision, which found fair use in 70 out of 75 excerpts, said that, that the use wasn't transformative, and the Court of Appeals agreed. Now, you could argue that. Uh, actually, Georgia State never made the argument that electronic reserves was a transformative use. They could have. They might have won. They might have lost. You're suggesting some ways in which that argument could be strengthened, and I think you're right. Uh, but Georgia State didn't make that argument, and the courts said that electronic reserves, uh, course readings that are just prevent, presented to students in an LMS, are verbatim copies that aren't repurposed, that aren't changed, that don't have new meaning. And for that reason, the court found, and this is now the precedent in three states, the three states that are in the 11th Circuit, that that use was not transformative. So, um, so Kevin, just to, just to clarify, the, the entire, that entire decision is about scholarly monographs only, right? Well, that was what was involved, yes. Right, but, so it, it, you, you could have a lot of other things in a course to which that argument would not apply. Say more. Well, because, because it's not going to, they, they didn't rule on or consider whether, say, showing clips of a film or uh, chapters from a novel that, that uh, was not a scholarly monograph. None of this was none of this was even litigated. No, you're right. Or that considered was... in that. So it really is restricted to when you have a scholarly monograph, uh, which in in which case the the argument for transformativeness really is a lot less a lot narrower it, it, at at its best. Although the two examples that you chose are interesting, if it's a film clip then I would suggest let's make sure that we can meet the uh, uh, 
uh, the requirements of the TEACH Act and not have to worry. Uh, and if it's a, a, a chapter of a novel, then I would actually be a little bit more worried because the second fair use factor is not going to help as much there. So I'd want to know what specifically are we doing to give that chapter of a novel new meaning. We may still have a transformative fair use argument there, but I'd, I'd, I'd want to know more before I said that that was transformative. And, you know, if I recall correctly from the decision, the appellate court said, yes, there could be transformational fair use in this context, but it's not on the table right now, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, so I'm not, so they, the, the trial judge didn't go there, the, the defense didn't go there, and so the appellate court didn't go there. Right, right, right. But we now do have this precedent that we, we would have to take into consideration. It may make it slightly harder to argue the, a transformative use uh, for materials that are just presented unchanged as course materials. That may not be good, but I think it's out there now. Okay, I want to um, jump ahead, and because I definitely want to get to um, to the topic of creating a copyright policy, but I just want to ask one question um, about permissions and licensing, and um, I guess really the the most important thing I want to talk about now is what role can and should the library play in providing permission services for distance learning education. Since my office does that, maybe I should take a shot at that. Um, when, when Duke began to offer MOOCs, and I know Duke and MOOC rhyme, when Duke began to MOOC, we, uh, we were approached about permissions, and I agreed that my office could reasonably do that. And in fact, the provost's office has put up the money to hire an intern 15 hours a week to work on permissions, and I've had great interns who have done that work. I think that libraries have an expertise in locating, they have resources for locating rights holders. They do have some expertise in negotiating with rights holders. We do it all the time for databases and other kinds of materials. Um, so I think the library can have a role here, and there are certainly some academic libraries where they have a permissions and copyright office. In, in my case, it's much more limited. It's specifically in the context of MOOCs, where we think we need permission more often than we would for a face-to-face -face course or even a, a, a use in a closed LMS. Um, but I do think there's a role here, and it's one of the ways that libraries can show to a campus that we have, I can't even believe we have to justify this, but we do sometimes, that we have continuing value, especially in the, in the, uh, in the digital learning or the distance learning context, where sometimes some administrators may think that the library is irrelevant. Uh, this is one of several places where we can demonstrate that we're not irrelevant in the distance learning environment. That said, sometimes permissions work can sort of be a black hole. <laughs> uh, Kevin is uh, wise and fortunate in that the uh, the material where they committed to do permissions work is limited right. um, because you know it can it can take a lot of time, and I really would encourage people not to underestimate the amount of time it can take, uh, especially if you're going to take on a more um, expanded role you know, beyond, say, a, a, a particular program or project. And more often than not, and I think you'll agree with this, Anne, what our role is is somebody gets in touch with us, whether they already know that they need permission or we go through a copyright analysis with them and decide they need permission, and then what we do is provide them with some uh, information and advice about how to do that, but we leave the permission seeking, the actual, you know, back and forth in their hands. And yeah, I would. That's that's for the best. Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I was once in a situation where I did all the negotiating too, um, and that can be difficult. Um, yes. You know, some rights holders don't respond shockingly enough, so <laughs> or don't respond quickly. 
and and I think the most important bit of advice about permission that I can give, and I, I give this even when I'm sending the person off to do it themselves, when my office isn't doing it, uh, is to be persistent, to not take no for an answer, at least not the first time. It's amazing how often, A, we don't get a response, but how often when we do get a response, the response is a kind of knee-jerk no, that clearly indicates that the rights holder hasn't even bothered to pay attention to what it is we're asking. Um, and so a lot of times we'll go back a second or even a third time to clarify what we're doing, that there's no profit involved, that no, we're not going to make enough money to be able to pay you $300, um, whatever it is, uh, being persistent going back uh, a couple of times, we do have some results, some success with uh, the second and the third question. Uh, but as you say, that's very time consuming. And a lot of the time, all we're going to do is advise the, right, the, uh, the potential user uh, on who to contact and to be persistent and that sort of thing. Okay, great. Um, Pat, how would you feel about talking to us about fair use and whether or not the library should play a role in fair use? I think I want, I think we have talked about fair use quite a bit, so maybe we could go on to something specific. Okay. Um, so a specific question would be, who should decide whether something is fair use? The professor, the librarian? So I think you, it depends on what, you, what, what the fair use question is, it, again, the context thing. So if what we're talking about is a professor wants to put some stuff up and you think this is beyond the TEACH Act, so you would be in fair use territory, um, then I don't think anybody but the professor knows what the real link between the material being repurposed here and the pedagogical purpose is. So one way or another, I think the professor has to explain something. Now, whether you want the librarian to make a judgment call about whether the professor is making any sense really is up to your up to your institution. But I think I think you, the the librarian can't read the professor's mind. Okay, so so only the professor really knows. Only the professor can really make that that distinction. Whether and it's I, fair use. I agree with that. Um, even I, Anne and I are both lawyers. Uh, who work in libraries, and yet I think both of us are hesitant to say in any context that's obviously fair use. Uh, there would be very rare circumstances in which I would do that. Instead, our role is to ask the right questions, uh, to help think through that context, and then try to point the, uh, the faculty member to what's important in making the decision. Um, because we're lawyers, we may be a little more heavy-handed. Uh, librarians who are not lawyers, the vast majority of librarians, uh, probably should be pretty careful about saying, yeah, that's fair use. Um, instead, they should help find resources about what it means, not just, I, I really encourage librarians not to just present the four factors, but to present things that like the Oh, the Copyright Advisory Office at Columbia has great materials on their website about how to make a fair use decision. Um, and so, you know, direct the faculty member to those kinds of resources. But I think Pat's absolutely right, that the only person who fully knows the context and can make a, a completely informed decision is going to be the professor. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, can we talk a little bit about, well, I think we have talked about media use. So I, I think we're going to jump ahead to some questions about copyright policy. And Anne, I wondered if you could tell us whether you think it's necessary for academic libraries to have copyright policies, and if so, why? Well, I think it's helpful. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, one of the, the challenges about copyright policies, and I think, you know, this I'm making some opening statements in, in what I think will be a pretty intensive discussion for the next few minutes. One of the things that's a challenge for libraries is that ideally a copyright policy happens within the, um, the context, there's that word again, of the entire university. So, uh, 
in the best of all possible worlds, the library is making policy um, in, in concert with administrators, whatever kind of counsel they have, uh, with, uh, and also with the library administration, and, and taking into account uh, the, the institution's stance on a number of issues, the institution's willingness to um, assist uh, faculty and staff who uh, make fair use decisions and uh, and support support faculty and staff who make those decisions. So I think that um, it is definitely helpful on some campuses. Um, it's more difficult than it is on others. Okay. And Pat, what are your thoughts on just dealing with copyright issues on a case by case basis? Well, you know, I think. I think um, the only area in which I know anything about copyright is, is in fair use. And fair use is by definition a case-by-case -case situation. On the other hand, some cases come up all the time and you get fairly used to uh, the, the, the kinds of judgments you're going to have to make. And again, I go back to all your other expressive rights, which is exactly how you do the other ones. You know, you know what's, what are your comfort levels with questions like, obscenity, treason, and libel because, you know, you're, you're practicing those rights. So, yes, it's case by case, but, but some of them are um, routine. And, you know, when we, when we helped the librarians create the uh, librarian's code, they found seven common situations in, that come up all the time in which they developed uh, standards for themselves on what, on what how fair use applies. And it's actually proven quite useful to people in establishing copyright policies at their institutions. Uh, one, qu one question that has come up a lot for librarians, for instance, is uh, I've got these decaying D uh, VHS tapes and they haven't, they haven't yet hit um, the, the preservation requirements, but, but I still want to be able to copy them and know they're not in the marketplace and I can't find a, a new DVD. Um, and my faculty member wants to show one of them in class. So, uh, the, the, one of the one of the categories deals with this common situation of of the code of best practices. So, I would say that a, applying the librarian's code of best practices and deciding what how you want how you want to shape uh, then that's where you know what the you know what what the community things are the best practices that can then help you establish what you want to do in your in your university. Okay, great. Um, Luann, let's hear from Luann for a few minutes. Um, your institution just created a policy and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that, what's involved in creating the policy and implementing it. Yes, so um, really a lot of the policy construction just involves many conversations, just like I think Anne mentioned, that many people in the university setting participate in those discussions because copyright impacts so many different areas, even outside of the library. So when I was brought in to Tiffin University, it was because we had about a year and a half ago hired a team of instructional designers and about two-thirds of our student population are actually strictly online students. So um, part of the process in hiring those instructional designers was to start looking at uh, developing course master shells from what they considered the best possible version of the course that was developed and, and really digging in and seeing what information was in those master shells and um, the instructional design team knew enough about copyright to know that they were starting to see some copyright issues and have some sort of scary discussions with faculty um, when, you know, the rationale is used, well, I've copied this entire website into this PDF document because I'm afraid they'll take the website down. Um, so the, the kind of things that make us a little bit twitchy. So they brought me in and they said, okay, uh, we need some assistance in doing something to address copyright. So I went through this process where as, as someone who is not an attorney and I'm not formally trained on copyright law, I had to do what I would imagine 
some of our participants are doing. I had to attend webinars. I had to go and get some more education so that I knew what I was dealing with. I think I lived on the ALA website with their materials on the TEACH Act and um, pulled together compliance checklists that I know a link for a checklist was shared earlier in the presentation. Um, and I took that checklist and then I started going to different departments and asking questions. And I talked to like, the head of our LMS team and said, okay, um, when students have access to our online courses, how long do they have access past the end of the term? Oh, it's indefinite. Okay, well, we might want to, we might want to mark that off to go back and talk about it. Um, I talked to our instructional designers and asked questions like, when you have a document in a course that's a PDF document and there's, there are no identifying marks at all on the document at all, how do you know that it's not something that comes from a website that someone has copied in verbatim? Um, you know, what checks are there to make sure that that's not happening? And I talked to the library. I said, okay, you hold the majority of the licensed resources, so what do you do to address copyright when someone's using a licensed resource? Um, are there policies in place to address e-reserves? Things like that. And then I also, because of my role in the School of Graduate and Distance Education, I have one foot in the library and one foot um, with the instructional design team, <clears throat> excuse me, so I had access to some of our online courses. So I was able to just sort of go in and, and just very briefly take a look-see um, and see what was going on in there. And then I took all of those findings back to our administration and said, here's what we're doing well, because I do believe that most institutions in some way or another in their processes do address copyright to some extent. And I said, and here are the areas where we probably need to work on some things. And the administration decided that that was the time to develop a committee and we placed folks from those different areas on the committee. So we had a faculty member who taught in the online environment. We had our director of curriculum and learning who oversees the instructional design team our library director, and one of our instructional technologists who handles a lot of the multimedia content. And we got together and we started looking at what other universities were doing to address copyright. And we did make it pretty specific to our online courses um, since that's where the majority of our student population resides. Um, and we started looking at other policies we tried to make sure that we were targeting other nonprofit institutions to see what they did. And we came out with a plan of things about those other policies that we liked, things that we didn't like. Um, and then we also looked at any connection that those policies had to potentially other policies. Uh, and we sat down and we started developing various documentation um, the library did not have an acceptable use policy for licensed resources. There was no policy on handling course reserves and e-reserves. So we wanted to make sure that those were documented as well. And then in our actual policy document itself, we spelled out sort of the history of why things were created the way that they were. Um, and then gave various procedural tasks to each department at each level in the development of an online course. Um, and then that policy went before our faculty and was approved by our faculty. Okay, so it was definitely a long process. <laughs> yeah, I add something? Can I add something to this discussion? I, I think that the process Luann has just described is an excellent one and does pay attention to the idea that it is not just the library's policy, but the library is involved with a lot of different parts of the university in, in setting a copyright policy. I, I just wanted to make one distinction that I think is really important about what we expect policy to do. In its purest state, a policy uh, memorializes a specific decision we are going to follow path X instead of path Y. 
Many copyright policies actually don't do that, or they do something much more than that. And that is they try to provide guidance about decision making. And when you ask Pat about a case-to-case -case basis, and she said quite properly, fair use is always a case-by-case -case decision. A policy about fair use is actually really going to be some guidance about how to make fair use decisions. So I can ma imagine it actually being a decision, a classic form of a policy, and that would be every faculty member must fill out a checklist for every reading that they put in the MLS, LMS. That would be a decision. Uh, on the other hand, a policy may say faculty should consult the code of best practices for this particular field before making fair use decisions. That would be closer to guidance. And I think it's important to remember that policies may do both things. They often do both things. And to keep in mind, what are the actual decisions? And that is, they're things that we're going to enforce in some way. And what is guidance? Um, a lot of our policies are more guidance than decisions. That's fine. I just think it's worth being aware of it. Yes, excellent. Thank you for mentioning that, Kevin. And again, you know, this is if you if you think in terms of the other expressive rights that people have, librarians are not telling the um, the professors how far they can go before um, they are going to be accused of making a treasonous statement. But they but they are but there are plenty of of um, of guidance, there's plenty of guidance on how to behave civilly. So we, we, you know, I think you always want to avoid uh, rigid, um, rigid bright lines because this is an area of expressive rights. Okay, great. Um, at this point, we only have about 14 minutes left. And so I wanted uh, the participants to have an opportunity to pose any questions, or if they had any questions that I didn't answer, uh, maybe bring those back up again, or that I didn't ask you to answer, um, if they could bring those back up again. Uh, so participants, now's your chance to pose some additional questions, and uh, we can see if the panelists will be willing to answer any of them. And we do have a question. Um, our library has a subscription to electronic resources through EBSCO. EBSCO has come up with a tool curriculum builder that allows the professor to go into the LMS to access the library resources directly through the LMS and place it into the readings for that class. Is this fair use? Um, and I don't know who, who might want to <laughs> try to tackle that one. Um, I'll give it a shot. So if I understand correctly, I've never used this tool. Um, they, they're, they're, there's interaction between the, um, the LMS and, and the EBSCO databases that allows, uh, allows, to, allows the uh, faculty member to pull a PDF into the LMS. Is this fair use? Um, it sounds like uh, EBSCO has made a contractual arrangement with the rights holder to allow that kind of um, interaction between the the uh, the LMS and, and the EBSCO databases. That would be my guess. And so, in that case, it might be fair use, but but uh, there's probably a contractual arrangement that um, undergirds that functionality. That was my, my interpretation as well. And as you say, it might or might not be fair use. But in this case, I think it's licensed use. So we don't get to the fair use question. OK, great. Um, we do have another question from Heidi Steiner Burkhart related to linking. She's curious for guidance on how to address when people find articles and other things that are posted somewhere online and most likely infringing on copyright. They're cl clearly protected, but people want to use them, and um, perhaps you could discuss for us contributory infringement. Kevin, are you? Oh, yeah. Well, I was hoping not to. 
I I I usually tell people um about linking that linking is almost always safe. Um in a case where you really, really believe or have cause to know that the material is there uh, illegally in a way that infringes, then I wouldn't link to that. But I don't think we should just assume. I mean, you know, if it's if it's yesterday's episode of NCIS, it may, <laughs> and it's not on the CBS website, then it's very likely that it's infringing. But in most other cases, it's really hard to know. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure you would have you would be a very good defendant for a contributory infringement action in that situation where you all you've done is linked. Uh, I, I don't see how that cause of action would work. Um, so I think, you know, for most cases you say you, it's clearly infringing. Why? Is it impossible that the rights holder would have uploaded it themselves? Uh, do you know who uploaded it and you know they did so without permission? Um, then don't link to it. But in a lot of cases, the stuff is out there. Um, linking is not going to create a big problem for you. And I, I really don't see, and maybe Ann uh, has a different view, but I really don't see how a contributory infringement uh, claim would work there uh, where you've linked to something without definite knowledge that it was infringing. Yeah, and I think there is case law um, that indicates that that um, you know, again, it, it depends. There's a whole bunch of factual situa situations that could change the analysis, but uh, uh, it, linking in this country is not normally going to be infringement, even if you if you link to something that's that is infringing. However, it is stupid if you know that it's <laughs> infringing. <laughs> and, For one uh, reason, because it's going to go away. Because it's going to go away, and uh, and you know, there's what I call the mom test. You know, what would you tell your mother if she said, "Why did you link to that?" But uh, but mostly just because it's going to go away. Now, sometimes people ask me about YouTube videos where it's pretty clear that they want to link to it. It's pretty clear that the person who uploaded didn't have own the rights to you know the popular song du jour. Um, in those cases. Uh, I usually say, you know, YouTube has taken care of the infringement. But in that case, they've surrounded the, the content with ads uh, or, or whatever, and uh, that doesn't bother me so much. But to, to link to something that says, "Ho oh, ho, oh, this is bootlegged," is just not a good idea for reasons that aren't don't have anything to do with the law. Yeah. And that's a good point. So many of these questions are about YouTube, and YouTube really works hard with rights holders and with their content detection systems, linking to YouTube is almost always going to be safe because they take care of that. And really, we use it at Tiffin as a learning opportunity for our faculty because uh, many faculty members don't know how to access the permalink in a library database, for example. Um, so we sort of, I guess, maybe turn the information literacy tables on them just a bit and uh, start talking to them about um, how they can think about resources, YouTube videos, things of that nature, and how they can pinpoint what is probably legally uploaded versus what's going to disappear in five minutes. So it's a great learning opportunity for them. Okay, great. We do have another question that I hope uh, someone on the panel will, will tackle. Why can't professors link to ebooks in libraries, but they can link to articles for course readings? And then tacked onto that question, is there a difference between an ebook that's purchased versus one that is subscribed to? Well, I think you could link to an ebook as long as you have a link. That uh, that goes through your authentication system in whatever way is necessary for that resource. Um, so I don't think there is a legal reason why you can't link to an ebook. It might be, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, at least that part of the question. As you say, there might be a technological restriction, but really the distinction between. Um, the journal article and the ebook is going to be based in the licensing. 
uh, yeah, the and, and the technology. The uh, the article database supports permalinks. Uh, nothing in the license forbids it. Uh, somebody asks in one of these questions about uh, EBSCO and Harvard Business Review. Uh, they have a specific licensing provision to prevent linkage. But otherwise, if you can do it in the EBSCO databases. So the permalink's there, the licensing permits it, you can go ahead and do it. With the ebook, it may be a technological block or it may be a contractual block, but there's no, in, there's no inherent difference. The difference is in how the technology works and what the licensing permits. And I think there was another part to the question, but I can't remember it now. <laughs> um, and I think Seth did clarify. He said if the professor is using an ebook as a required course reading for the class, uh, but they can link to articles for course readings, he said. So they can't link to ebooks, but they can link to articles. But I think you've addressed that. Okay. Yeah. And we really are running low on time, so I did just want to make a few. Um, oh, I, we, I think uh, Tina has asked this question a couple of times. So let's just slip this one into what guidelines are there for using streaming media in LMS courses for subsequent semesters that's been created under fair use from analog because there is no streaming version? <laughs> I treat it pretty much like other formats um, as far as, you know, looking at the same kind of analysis. So we're Don't forget it. copyright law is medium agnostic. Context. Transformativeness. Okay. So it doesn't go like away because you're using it again. Buzzwords. <laughs> okay. So Tina's happy with the answer she got. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, and um, give some closing remarks. Um, thank you to the panelists, really, Kevin, Ann, Pat, and Luann, for giving us your time today and sharing your knowledge and experience. I think that we could have talked a lot more about this topic. I know we could have talked a lot more about this topic. Um, I'd also like to, to thank all of the participants who joined us. Thank you for submitting some great questions. Um, we would like to continue to provide this kind of programming if people think it's, about, it's worthwhile for us to do so. But in order for us to determine that, it's really important for us to hear from you about what you experienced today. So we would ask that you complete our, um, our feedback survey. And I'm going to go ahead and put that link into um, the chat box. If you'll bear with me for just a moment. We do need your feedback. And so the link to the survey is now in the chat box. Surveys are anonymous and confidential, so unless you choose to reveal your identity to us, um, we will not know who you are. The session was recorded, so everyone who registered will be receiving a link to the recorded session, along with a link to the feedback survey shortly. And again, thanks everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you at our other upcoming distance learning section discussion group programs. And thank you again to Pat, Luann, Kevin, and Anne for joining us and for, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.